Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Do Your Part, where we look at some of the challenges facing young people today and how to overcome them. And we look at some of the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to reform our character and for us to be a positive influence on our society. In the previous episode, we talked about marriage. And our discussion led us up to through the issue of choosing a husband and wife, what sort of characteristics and qualities you look at, through to how to meet somebody and through to some of the kinds of things that you need to be careful of in the moments leading up to the wedding and up to the marriage with the permission of Allah Azza In this episode, inshallah, we are looking at what goes on from there. From the beginning of married life, which is the day of the wedding, through the rights of the husband and the rights of the wife and how we can have a positive impact in our families and how we can avoid arguments from happening and how we can fix them when they happen. So this is quite a, a lot to cover inshallah and we're going to begin by looking at the issue of the wedding day. Because in reality the whole wedding or the whole marriage begins with this day and on this day a lot of evil is often done that makes the, 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 the future success of the marriage very difficult to sustain. And there's no doubt that when you do a good deed, that good deed has an effect on the rest of your life. It has an effect on you doing further good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He gives increase to those who are guided with guidance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you do something good, He gives you an increase and an ability to do something good uh, after that. One of the scholars, or, or indeed quite many of the scholars have mentioned in Islam, that one of the signs that your good deeds have been accepted is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the ability to do another good deed after it. So one of the scholars, they, he was asked, he was phoned up and he was asked, Shaykh, how do I know that my hajj has been accepted? He said, it's very simple. If you come back from hajj and you find yourself doing good deeds, then you can have a good feeling inside of yourself that inshallah, your hajj has been accepted. And if you find yourself returning and the day you return, you're doing bad deeds, then you can take it that it's quite possible and Allah knows best that your hajj has not been accepted. So likewise, we apply this to marriage. If your wedding day is a day of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're obeying Allah azza wa jal, you're fulfilling the laws and the commandments of Allah, and you see that the day after and the day after and the day after you're continuing to obey Allah azza wa jal, this is a sign there's going to be barakah in the marriage. And if you find that uh, the, that the, there is the opposite, that the wedding day is a day of disobedience to Allah azza wa jal, then again, you can, you know, you, you know that there's something needs to be fixed. And this applies to all of the issues in Islam. It applies to Ramadan and Eid. It applies to, you know, you, you hope that your fasting has been accepted. If you want to know if your fasting has been accepted, look at the day of Eid. If you obey Allah Azza wa on the day of Eid, then take glad tidings, inshallah, that your fasting has been accepted. And if you find that you have not obeyed Allah Azza wa on the day of Eid, then fear that Allah perhaps has not accepted your deeds because one of the signs of good deeds is that they lead you to other good deeds. So the day of the wedding, what are some of the problems that happen? Many of the problems that happen are related to issues of compromising in the issue of the religion. When you compromise in the issue of the religion for anything, it never brings any good. So people say, subhanAllah, you have a sister who is fully covered her whole life. She is absolutely pious, she's absolutely uh, chaste, she doesn't mix with men, and yet on her wedding day she's willing to leave all of that. She's willing to uncover in front of people, she's willing to mix with people that she would never dream of mixing with, she's willing to go out in her zina, in her decoration, and in, in her beauty in front of people who are not allowed to see it. She's willing to listen to music that she wouldn't normally listen to, she's willing to compromise. The brother who never misses his prayer, five times a day he prays and yet on his wedding day he doesn't think about his prayer and his prayer goes out of his mind. And so he begins his wedding and he begins the, this relationship between the husband and wife by abandoning the greatest obligation upon him after La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Huge problem. Again, the brother who normally dresses very Islamically and is very conscious of his Islamic dress and conscious of his, you know, his, his Islamic etiquettes like the beard and like you know, the, the clothes being above the ankles and so on and so forth, again, comes to the wedding day and they're willing to compromise. So the issue here is don't compromise. 
And for you not to be able to compromise or not to compromise on that day, it requires something, requires planning. It requires the tawfiq of Allah, the success of Allah, but it requires you to plan. So you think about how are you going to pray? You think about how is the sister going to remain covered? You think what is going to happen if a non-mahram man walks into the room where the women are? Does she have a means of being covered? Is there something that can be put in front of her? What are you going to do if people begin to take photos? You have a plan. And when you have this plan, inshaAllah ta'ala, with the help of Allah and by seeking help from Allah and being focused upon you know, doing the right thing, inshaAllah ta'ala, everything will go fine. And likewise, you need to also think about the fact that it's not just about you and uh, whether brother or sister on that day. There are lots of other people in attendance. And just because you are very observant of Islam doesn't mean that they are very observant of Islam. And that comes to the issue of, like we've said before and like inshallah ta'ala will be mentioned again, the issue of said the dhara'i, of cutting off the paths, the means that lead to haram. So don't give an opportunity for a man to walk into the women's section. Don't give an opportunity for people to mix in a way that is haram and for haram relationships to develop outside of the wedding. Don't give an opportunity for people to snap photos of people uncovered and whatever and then share them on Facebook or whatever it may be. Don't give people the opportunity to do the haram because you have no guarantee that those people are going to be practicing Islam the same way that you are. So this is something to do with the wedding day. Again, the prayer is critical. No way should the prayer be delayed or should the prayer be uh, not prayed or should anyone be joining between anything. The prayer has its fixed times. The prayer has been given fixed times. So the prayer is given attention to. And this sometimes uh, needs a bit of thought, especially with regard to issues of making wudu when someone is dressed up and when someone is ready for their wedding. It can be difficult. Uh, things like uh, nail varnish preventing the wudu and things like that. So there needs to be some thought and some planning. So this is the issue briefly of the wedding day. After the wedding day, we come to the issue of living together and the rights of the husband and the rights of the wife. There are different rights of the husband and wife in Islam. Some of those are shared rights that both husband and wife have. Some of those are rights that are for the husband and some of those are rights that are for the wife. And these are critical to the success of the marriage because at the end of the day, people's cultures differ. People's interpretations differ. People's personalities differ. And there's no common ground that you can use to say who is right or who is wrong. And there's no common ground that you can use to sort your arguments out unless that common ground is what Islam gives you. So if a woman comes and she says, my husband doesn't spend enough time with me. We say to her simple, the Sharia has given you a fixed amount of time or a guideline to an amount of time. Let us look and see whether your husband is fulfilling that. If he's fulfilling that, then we can say he's doing the minimum that a husband needs to do and we can encourage him to do more. But if he's not fulfilling that, we can criticize him. And it's not about whether she feels that way or not, but it's about what does the Sharia say? And that's a key principle in the whole of Islam, that if you disagree about something, if you disagree about something, return it back to Allah and his messenger. Return it back to the Quran and return it back to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you really believe in Allah in the last day. This is better and it is a better means of interpretation. So what we do, we return these issues back to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we use that to judge between people and to judge in fairness between people regarding whether or not they are giving each other their rights. So once we recognize that there are rights that are shared and there are rights for the husband and rights for the wife, those are the minimum. But likewise, we don't necessarily need to be sticking to the minimum. There's no harm in us trying to be even better. When you look at the, the rights of the wife in Islam, the Prophet wasallam said, the best of you are those who are best to their wives. So yes, there is a minimum amount of time that you need to spend with your family in order to be said that you are fulfilling the basic requirements of Islam. But if you want to be from the best of the people, then there is a level above that and that's about striving. Aisha radiallahu anha said that when she was asked about how was the Prophet sallallahu at home, she said he used to be in the service of his family. 
Subhanallah, there's nobody, nobody on the face of this earth was more busy than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had the entire affairs of a nation, not just a nation, but all the nations that are to come afterwards, and the, the, the mankind, and the jinn, all of these people that he was sent to, to think about the issues of fighting of, of the Islamic empire, of government, the issues of guiding the people, the issues of teaching, the problems that were happening, the plots of the enemies of Islam. He was insanely busy. And yet, when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, what did she say? That the Prophet sallallahu spent most of his time at home, he was in the service of his family. So there is a minimum level when it comes to the rights of the husband and the rights of the wife, and there is a, something that you can aim for. And that is to be the best husband or the best wife that you can possibly be. So yes, a wife, for example, can demand certain things from her husband. For example, again, she can demand her own accommodation. She can demand that she does not want to live with her husband's parents or uh, other family members. That's within her right to have her own accommodation. But let's imagine that she knows that will be difficult for her husband and she knows that it, he's struggling a little bit financially and she knows that he wants to be near to his parents so she overlooks and she lets the issue go. And that again is an example of the most wonderful manners in Islam. Overlooking your rights and letting them go in favour of other people and preferring people over others. Preferring people over others. So you look and even though you know you have a right, you let that right go, whether you're a husband or whether you're a wife, in order for them to have be things to be easier for them, and you know that your reward is with Allah Azza wa Jal. So that's enough for the first part of the episode. In the second part of the episode, we're going to talk more specifically about individual rights of the husband, individual rights of the wife, and the combined rights of both, inshaAllah ta'ala. That's coming up. Welcome back to Do Your Part. We're talking about marriage and married life we're talking about the rights of the husband and the wife and we're taking this episode following on from the previous episode that looked at the issue of getting married we're now looking at married life and how to sort of get over the issues that happen between husband and wife and what the rights of the husband and the wife are like we said there are rights that are for the husband there are rights that are for the wife and there are rights that are shared let's begin by looking at some of the rights of the wife in islam and again i don't presume that in this episode we're going to cover every single right but inshallah ta'ala we will cover some of the most important rights and then from then on we have the principle that when you disagree on something as we said in the first part of the episode you look at Islam and you say does Islam allow me this right and then you also ask yourself as we said at the very end of the first part of the episode can I overlook my right can I give my right up can I prefer someone over me like what happened with Aisha radiallahu anha when Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, passed away and he came to Aisha radiallahu anha or he sent his son Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with them both to Aisha radiallahu anha to ask permission to be buried next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, I had hoped or I had intended that this space was going to be for me next to my husband and next to my father. I thought this was going to be my space. But today I have preferred Umar over me. And this action of preferring someone over yourself is something that is very important and it's critical to success in marriage. So some of the rights of the wife. There are financial rights which include the issue of the dowry. She ha the wife has the right to the mahar. Uh, the dawa I think is probably the more appropriate word than a dowry. And she has the right to be spent upon uh, in a good way and she has the right to accommodation. So if we look at the mahar, the best mahar, the best dawa is that which is small and easy. There is no minimum limit and there is no maximum limit, but it is about that which is small and that which is easy. And this is how we put barakah in the marriage and the Prophet ﷺ told us that the marriages with which will have the most blessing, that will be the most blessed, are those for which the mahr is the easiest. So yes, a woman wants to ask for something that's going to keep her secure and going to give her some of, you know, some security in return for uh, her entering into this uh, contract of married life uh, but at the same time she doesn't want to burden her husband with debt that is going to last him for the rest of his life or going to last him for a big portion of his life so again it's not about uh, necessarily um, it being uh, a massive amount of money but about the easiest mahar is that which is the smallest there is the issue of spending upon his wife 
and what he needs to do is to spend according to his ability. So if he is wealthy, then he needs to spend upon his wife in a way that is appropriate for his own standard of living. So to clothe her with what he clothes himself with, as in if he has a certain standard of clothing that he ba maintains that standard uh, with his wife, if he has a certain standard of living, a certain uh, quality of food, a certain thing that he feeds her from what he feeds himself with, that he doesn't require her to live in accommodation that is much less than his accommodation, uh, or that, it, that he is you know, living a much higher standard of life than she is. So the issue of spending is not an issue where she, he is required to spend a certain amount of money, but it's an issue where he is required to spend from what he spends upon himself. So whatever he has and he gives to himself, he also shares with his wife. So there's the issue of spending. The issue of accommodation. A wife has the right to her own accommodation. It's a simple right in Islam, and it's not a right that is disagreed upon in Islam. She has the right to her own accommodation. She can give up that right, but she has the right to her own accommodation. She does not have to be forced to live with other family members. And again, these are things that can be discussed before the marriage to make sure that this doesn't develop into an issue. But if it does develop it into an issue, and she's tried and she can't manage it anymore, then she has the right to say to her husband, I want to have my own accommodation. Now, it doesn't mean he has to provide it within a day or an hour, but it means that he has to make a commitment to do so and he has to do it as quickly as he can according to the ability that he has financially and otherwise. In terms of non-financial rights, the lady, she has the right to fair division of time between him and his, if he has uh, other wives, that he gives her a fair division of time, that he doesn't uh, prefer uh, other uh, family members or you know his other wives over her and he doesn't sort of uh, oppress her with regard to his time she has the right to be treated tre in a decent and reasonable manner and this encompasses many many things in Islam but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us time and time again in many different methods and many different ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us wa bil ma'ruf and live with them in a good way live with them in a way that is decent and a way that is reasonable and again, some of this goes down to the culture of the people and some of it goes down to the way people interact with each other. But what is important is that he is reasonable and fair towards her. And more than that, he's not just reasonable and fair, but he's aiming to go beyond that. Because the best of you are those who are best to your wives. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said, and he said, and I am the best of you to my wives. So the Prophet ﷺ, being the best of the people to his wives, he's setting us a standard that being decent, being fair, being reasonable, and on top of that, uh, being a person who is aiming and striving to be the best person that he can be for his wife. And there's something here which is worth noting, which is true for the wife and it's true for the husband as well. It's true for both the wife and it's true for the husband as well. And that is knowing what your partner, what your spouse wants, knowing what they like and knowing what they dislike. There is a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that when she entered or when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered the house one day, he saw some pictures that were on the walls, some curtains, and they had some sort of uh, pictures of uh, living beings on them. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became angry. But the point here that we want is that Aisha said, I saw the anger of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his face. I saw his face change. And she knew instantly, this is, means my husband is not happy. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ knew the same about Aisha. He said in a hadith that is narrated وسلم, that when you are happy with me, you swear by Allah and you say, Wa Rabbi Muhammad, by the Lord of Muhammad. And when you're angry with me, I can tell you're angry with me because you, you swear by the Lord of Ibrahim. So even the Prophet ﷺ could see when Aisha radiallahu anha was happy with him and when she was upset about something. So it's very important as part of the living together and being decent with each other and treating each other in a fair and reasonable manner that uh, you look at uh, what each other likes and you learn to see when each other are happy and when each other are not happy. So this is part of living in a reasonable manner and not to be treat in a harmful way. This is a right of a wife upon her husband that she isn't treat in a harmful way. And the Prophet ﷺ was asked about those people who are physically rough with their wives, who, who go over a limit uh, physically, 
And he said, these people are not the best of you. So again, in Islam, we are told not to go overboard, not to harm her, not to treat her in a way that is anything other than respectful and proper. And so this is a critical right of uh, the husband and the right of the wife as well. So then we come to the issue of the rights that are the husbands. So these are amongst the greatest rights because the Prophet ﷺ said, I would not have commanded anyone to prostrate to anyone or to bow to anyone. But if I were to command anyone to bow or prostrate to anyone, I would have said for a wife to prostrate before her husband because of, again, all of the, the, the his spending upon her. Uh, she, of course, has the right to be spent upon and he has the, it's his, it's his obligation to spend upon her in the means that he can. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that women have rights over their husbands similar to the rights of their husbands over them. So we see that there are some shared rights according to what is reasonable, but men have a degree of responsibility over them. So the husband, he is the head of the family. That doesn't mean that he doesn't consult his wife. He consults her, he seeks her advice as the Prophet wasallam sought the advice of his wives. May Allah be pleased with them all. He sought their advice, he asked their help, particularly we see in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah when the people didn't want to accept or couldn't accept that they weren't going to perform the Umrah. And then the Prophet ﷺ sought advice from one of his wives and she gave him the advice that he was to slaughter his animal and to shave his head in order to demonstrate to the people and then they followed him in doing so. so from the rights of the husband over the wife are the right that the wife obeys uh, her husband in that which is good. So she doesn't obey him in disobedience to Allah, but when he asks her to do something, she does so. And this is just part of a simple, positive family environment. And it's, it's simple, like when you have at work, you have a boss, right? You have somebody who is in charge because when people have a social structure, it simply means that things work better. And that doesn't mean at all for a second that we are saying that a husband should be uh, sort of a, a have, a, have a, an iron fist and sort of be very, very aggressive and sort of be commanding in the house, not at all. But that when the decision needs to be made, his decision is final and Allah Azza wa Jal will take him to account. Because if he's oppressed his wife, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will take him to account for what he does. So there is the obligation of obedience. There is the obligation of his wife being available to him. At the end of the day, marriage has a physical aspect as well. And it's important that the wife is always available for her husband in a physical sense, because if she isn't, the danger is that perhaps something will happen that will lead to break up the marriage or perhaps the husband will not be able to contain himself and he may even start to look at something which is haram or start to do something which is haram. And this will lead to the breakdown of the society because the family is the backbone of society. So one of the rights of the husband is that whenever he is in need of his wife physically, she's available for him. Likewise, not admitting anyone that her, that her husband dislikes into the house. So if there's someone that her husband doesn't like, he, he's not friends with, or there's a little bit of a problem between them, that his wife respects her husband's honor and she protects his honor in her absence. Likewise, that the wife is careful when she goes out of the house, that her husband knows where she's going, that she asks for his permission, that there's a kind of a cooperation between the two of them. And that the husband, if he wishes to sort of admonish his wife, Again, he has the right to do so, but that right is done within the limits of the Sharia, within the limits of the Sharia. And we talked many, many of these, uh, the rights, the right of the wife to, to serve the husband, to sort of look after his affairs, to look after his home. And again, there is a minimum requirement and there is a higher requirement. So at the end of this episode, inshallah, what we can say is that there are rights for the husband, there are rights for the wife, and that there are rights shared between the two of them. And at the end of the day, if our focus is Islam and our focus is obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal, there's no reason why we can't make these issues work together. As for when disagreements come, we said that the key thing here is to return it back to the Quran and the Sunnah, to judge these disagreements in light of the Quran and the Sunnah, and to try to strive for the sake of Allah to overcome them as much as possible. That's all we have time for in this episode, inshaAllah ta'ala. Inshallah, we will meet in a future episode. And until then, I leave you in the care of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa